Yeah. I'm going to call to order the April 10th, 2023 meeting of the Corona Public Building Committee uh, under the governor's or emergency order uh, suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, chapter 38, section 20, issued March 12th, 2020. And in effect, until the termination of the emergency, meeting of public bodies may be conducted virtually, provided that adequate access is provided to the public. This meeting is being, uh, rather, on March 29, 2023, the remote public meeting provision was extended most recently to March 31st of 2025. This meeting is being held at the public meeting, public library community room and is available to be accessed uh, by the public via Zoom and is also being recorded for viewing via the town's website. As some, as some members will be attending remotely, we will be observing our roll call voting process which we have used in full and remote meetings as required by the emergency order. So nice to see everyone in uh, three dimensions for a change. It's great. And uh, with that, uh, we're going to take the first item for business, which is the uh, approval of the minutes for the March 27th, 2023 meeting. Is there a motion to approve the minutes? Motion to approve. Thank you. What? Is there a second? Second. second. Great. For the discussion, hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those, oh, roll call, roll call, roll, 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 roll All right, uh, Stuart is not online yet, let's take it. Uh, Lynn? Aye. George? Aye. Roy? Aye. Erwin? Aye. And the chair votes aye, thank you. All right, the second item for business is the uh, Emory Grover uh, renovation at the also Hillside. And for that, uh, I guess, uh, Ken, would you like to uh, sure. Good, good to see everybody in three dimensions, as uh, everyone said. Hillside, as everyone knows, done. Uh, we have uh, a change order and some and an, uh, invoice uh, tonight for that, and that will close out uh, the Hillside end of the project. Uh, at, Emory, at, the, at Emory Grover, uh, we uh, worked the elevator pit, the pits poured, the shaft walls were poured up to the first floor today. Uh, along with uh, the North Shear Wall uh, in the, on the lower level. Uh, CMU walls on uh, CNF line are substantially complete. They were getting topped off today. The Coltex system, along with the underground roof drain line, were installed in the front of the building. And the structural steel columns on C line were installed from the lower level to the roof. The other side of the trusses uh, upstairs in the, uh, on the upper level. And that's a Quick recap of the uh, progress on site. Any, any questions? Uh, sure. Pic sure the pic pictures are pictures are up there. So that's the uh, that's the elevator uh, shaft wall that was poured today. Uh, you can see from the the, pit, the concrete that you see is the pit, and then the uh, rebar to the uh, first first floor. They poured essentially to the underside of those uh, uh, choices today. Kind of a top-down view of the, uh, the same the same area as before the uh, some of the forms went in. You can see the machine over in the corner there that was used to excavate the uh, the basement. Location in the same place as it was. Excuse the me. Location of the elevators in the same location. The lines itself. Yes. And that's the uh, the upline columns, and then to the right. Get to the, when we get to the next picture, I think you'll be able to see the uh, C line columns. Yep, you can see the uh, when you scroll it back down right there on the left, you can see the uh, one of the, the columns, structural steel columns going up from the lower level up to the uh, to the roof. It's two truss on the third floor, those two columns. So that rebar that's sticking out that you see is for the added shear walls that were required once we did the demo we crawl last month uh, I, I discussed that some of the masonry walls that they thought were in place were not so these shear walls have been added to uh, add lateral stability for the uh, for the building that's, nice. that's the uh, some of the underground drains going into the uh, coltex system um, in front of the building this is to capture the water off the roof drains to keep the town's phosphorus numbers in, in check. This is basically just the equivalent of a large leaching field. Uh, 
last one. Any questions on the progress? What's the status of the uh, the, the surprise beam? Uh, it, it's uh, good. It's going to happen in Kamaui. It's yeah. it's actually in the uh, uh, um, the change order uh, for for tonight. It's less than what I had originally presented at the ACL. So right. that was that was the uh, the, the good news. Excellent. Um, and on the ACL, we have. Uh, the ACM number went up. I don't think it's going to be this high. This is what they presented us with, but neither uh, M. O'Connor nor I uh, agree with what the, the vendor presented. So we're still trying to work our way through that. And then that $52,000 number is for the added shear walls uh, that I noted, along with some other items that are, that are required based on the discovery of uh, things that aren't there weren't there that they assumed were going to be there. So questions on the ACL? If there's none, Richard, we can go into the uh, the voting items. Very good, excellent. Uh, in fact, a couple of change orders, uh, should we take those first? Uh, at, le at least the Cardosi one, the O'Connor one, it doesn't matter, but the Cardosi one, yes, please. Okay. Then uh, with that, um, uh, the chair will make a motion that uh, the uh, that the EDC approve the change order number six for Hillside for JJ Car uh, Cardosi Incorporated in the amount of four thousand fifty five and sixty two dollars for general contracting services. So, thank you, Michael. Um, any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, I'll uh, we'll do a roll call vote. Sorry. Um, okay, Stuart's not on yet. Um, Lynn? Aye. George? Aye. Roy? Aye. Erwin? Aye. Gene's not here. Uh, Michael? Aye. Ann? Can I need you? Yeah. Ann, can you hear us? Can you unmute yourself? Or maybe she's not. I can hear you now. Um, your vote on the uh, change order for uh, Cardozo? Can you hear us, Ann? Uh, yes, I can. Thank you. Yeah, we're actually in the middle of a vote now for the uh, change order for JJ Cardozo, no matter 405562. Uh, are, are you voting me for her? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So that uh, uh, the chair will also vote aye, and uh, therefore the matter is approved. Okay. The uh, in the next order, uh, item ten, would you like me to take? Uh, okay. Pick pick one. That's the only one we had to do for us. You can go through the invoice, and you can do the car dosing. Yeah. Okay. Rec, however you want to do it. Yeah. Let's let's do the um, uh, car dosing invoice. Requisition number six in February 20, uh, 2023 in the amount of 302,334.41. Chair will so move. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Michael. Any discussion on the uh, motion? Okay, hearing none, we will come to a roll call vote. And um, uh, Lynn? George? Aye. Roy? Aye. Erwin? Aye. Gene's not here. Uh, Michael? Aye. Anne? Aye. And the chair votes aye. I understand that that closes the show. Correct. Correct. Yeah. All right. We'll proceed then, I guess, to the, uh, the change order for Ren O'Connor contracting. The uh, uh, chair moves that, uh, that uh, change order number two for Henry Grover uh, be approved in the amount of 352,111.85. Uh, we try to uh, comment on the change order. Um, just a, a, a couple things. The uh, shoring and masonry demo PCO for EG um, that was originally in the ACL is two hundred sixty thousand. Got that down to one hundred fifty three by big borrowing and stealing. Uh, beam removal was originally twenty five thousand. It's now little over fifteen. Um, in the uh, Electric submeters went up. The original number that I had presented was just for the meters. 
this now adds all the controls that are, that are required. Um, this is for the monitoring for Eversource for the rebate program. We have motion has been made for a second on the motion. Second. Thank you, Michael. Any discussion, questions? For me? Are there any other larger items? Um, the only, only, the only two we have right now, those two that are in the ACL are nothing. Uh, um, let's say I think that does pop up, but that's where so that's a small item. Yeah, no, just those for the the uh the, the the fourth item in that with the floor and the lane, which we talked about last month, where um, we have to add the plywood to what basically to act as a core stop, if you will, because the subfloor, which originally was going to be the the base, if you will, for the core, it, it's, there's too many gaps in it. So the, the plywood, the plywood's also being used to act as a little bit of lateral stability with the, with the choice, and that was the the one nineteen. Also, they they total up to the three fifty two. Okay. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none. We will proceed to the the vote. Barry has a. Oh, sorry, Barry. Go ahead. Thank you. Sorry. I think I might be the only one on, on TV here or uh, uh, on Zoom. Oh, no, me and Ann. I can't see everything that everybody else is seeing. I don't think. I'm just, I have a question because I can't, sometimes can't keep up with a lot of these change orders either. And um, is there any way to put a, like I can, like whatever I'm looking at is, I had a, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at my own. Um, I pulled up my own, uh, the what Catherine sends out um to follow along because it's not keeping up on zoom but you know when i see these change orders and it just has a total amount just as number six number two is there any way to actually put a few lines of description so people remember that some of these change orders what they what they were associated with whether it was the floor underlayment or the additional masonry and demo um because three hundred fifty two thousand dollars it's a it's a significantly sized change order and it'd be nice to see a couple items listed next to it that that kind of you know tally up to what that change order was for it was in the agenda i sent out on friday barry to everybody can you see the screen now yeah i can't see that that's the thing i can't see oh there we go oh there it is okay oh it's there look at that <laughs> that's the that's the agenda i sent out to everybody on friday i thought i saw that but i'm like where why am i missing this all right it was in the agenda okay it just helps it helps me i know it helps me remember of what we've talked about in the past when it comes up to these these uh, bigger change orders, like what, what they amounted to. All right, thanks. Yep, absolutely, thank you. Okay, um, I think we need to take the, uh, the vote that we mostly made and seconded. So we'll take our roll call vote then on, on the, uh, this again is on, on change order number two, the 352,111. Lynn? Aye. George? Aye. Roy? Aye. Erwin? Aye. Michael? Aye. And Ann? Aye. And Chair both aye. Thank you for that. Uh, next item uh, under Emory Grover is the um, PSS for, for the architect BH plus A. This is PSS number nine for FFE services in the amount of $50,000. Uh, the motion chair will so move. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Michael. Any, uh, any, would you like any commentary discussion? Uh, yes. I mean, this, this is for the uh, purchasing of the uh, furniture at uh, FFE. Um, and they're initiating the design process. We had a preliminary layout that was part of the schematic design. Um, and this was an agreed upon amount for their services in design. The budget that we have for the FFE is a half a million dollars. Um, and that, that's carried in uh, also in the numbers that you have. Correct. This is similar to what we if you recall, similar to what we did at uh, public safety. Okay. Any other questions or comments from the committee? Uh, Going that, we'll proceed to the uh, roll call vote. And Stuart just joined us. Oh, thank you. Welcome, Stuart. Hello, how are you? Sorry I'm late. No worries at all. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the motion then to uh, for uh, uh, PSS number nine FFE services BH plus A fifty thousand dollars. Motion has been made and seconded. 
I'll uh, call to the roll call vote now. Uh, Stuart? Aye. Thank you. Uh, Lynn? Aye. Thank you. George? Aye. Roy? Aye. Erwin? Aye. Thank you. And then Michael? Aye. Ann? Aye. Thank you. And the chair votes aye. Thank you all. Next item under um, Emory Grover is uh, for uh, the invoice for M Connor contracting requisition number four through March in the amount of $419,100 and 68 cents. The chair will still move. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Michael. And uh, I don't know if there are any commentary that uh, you would like to make on this. No, uh, any no questions? Okay. Any questions from the, uh, from, from the committee? So we're changes from September. No, this is, these, these are, I'll just call stock um, schedule value items. And review them carefully. <laughs> <laughs> of that, we have no doubt. <laughs> okay, great. Um, the motion has been made and uh, seconded. Uh, we'll, do, we'll proceed then to a roll call vote. Stuart? Aye. Thank you. Lynn? Aye. George? Aye. Roy? Aye. Erwin? Aye. Thank you. Uh, Michael? Aye. Ann? Aye. Thank you. And the chair votes aye. Thank you, Paul. And uh, there's two more items under Henry Grover. Next is the invoice for B plus, BH plus A for architectural services in February 2023 for Henry Grover in the amount of $17,300.90. Chair will so move. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Michael. Uh, any uh, questions or discussion from the committee? Hearing none, we'll proceed to the, the roll call vote. Uh, Stuart? Aye. Thank you. Lynn? Aye. Thank you. George? Aye. Thank you. Roy? Aye. Thank you. Erwin? Aye. Thank you. Michael? Aye. Thank you. Ann? Aye. And the chair both sides. And that is an invoice for UTS of Massachusetts uh, for March 2023 materials testing in the amount of $1,440.1040. Uh, the chair will so move. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Michael. Uh, and uh, any discussion and questions from the committee? Hearing none, we will come to the, uh, the, the roll call vote. Uh, Stuart? Aye. Thank you. Lynn? Aye. Thank you. George? Aye. Thank you. Roy? Aye. Thank you. Erwin? Aye. Michael? Aye. Thank you. Ann? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Thank you. And uh, any other questions or comments uh, before we leave the topic of the Emory Global Building? Question. How's O'Connor doing as a contractor overall? Very good. You're, you're thinking that this no, they, they're, they're fine. They're, they're easy to work with, fair, um, on top, right on top of them. So their sites are intended and very good. Never you to agree. Is that? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was slow. I could. <laughs> You asked her if she agreed. So overall, yeah. Remember, there's a different there's a difference when dealing with the architect versus dealing with the owner. Right. Right. You're <laughs> kidding. The, opinion, the opinions may. I'll ask you the same question. What, what are your general comments about the problem? The only comment I would say that's um, maybe a not a positive is I think they're not necessarily reviewing submittals on their subs before they're putting them. Um, they're not reviewing submittals from their subs before they're forwarding it along. So we're finding an awful lot that we have to send back. And are we, do we agree to that? Yeah. I, I don't see them as quickly as they yeah. do. They, 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 they don't, I mean, I could go in and, and look at them, but I'm generally not looking at them until I get an approval out of the architect because if there's something that they need to change. Work on together to try to get them to enter. I think part of the problem might be also their their project manager is I don't want to say he's new, but he's uh, uh, relative relatively new. And I get the feeling this might be his 
first project as a project manager, but he's being overseen by their uh, VP of operations. So I'm not concerned about his, his newness, but I think that might play a part in what, uh, um, what Deborah has mentioned. They've, they've been, it's been discussed. It's not unusual. It's, it's correctable. It's correctable. It's yes. Early. I think it's experience. Yeah. I think it, it, it'll, it'll get better with experience. Thank you for the pictures, Ken. I, I just, because I don't get to see it. Yeah. Or you can stop by any time. Uh, I might, I will take you up on that, but I think it's great to see that so people can get, get a sense of I get, how things are moving. I get, I get, I get, spare, I get spare lids in my uh, storage bathroom, so. I'll take you up on that. His final question for me, I know we asked it last time, but status of the uh, sign for the fixing? Sign for the it, it, uh, We gave them the image for it, right. so they just have to have it made it's up. Gone, it's, gone, it's gone out to their, uh, their sign person. But I, I, I suspect the turnaround on those is generally two, three, two, three weeks. Yeah. The agent will say, "Get you got it to them like a week or two ago." Oh, so. At least it's in process. Yes. Okay. We have a couple minutes before our uh, next uh, topic on the agenda, which is the library space utilization. I thought maybe we could uh, take up a couple of other invoices while we're while we're um, waiting for eight o'clock hour. And um, so with that, uh, I'd like to uh, put forth a, a motion to for under the public safety uh, complex in FS2, uh, invoice for Napa Framingham, uh, that's FF and E for a tire changer, lift, bead seater, and a drum mount, the amount $13,041.94. Is there a, uh, a, a chair will so move, move, is there a second for that motion? Second. Thank you. What? Um, perhaps um, I don't know. Uh, Ken, would you like to comment on uh, what the particulars are of this? Of this hey, well, it's it, what, what is multiple it? items in there, but it's basically all the parts for a tire changer oh. for, the, for the PD mechanic shop. Okay. <laughs> and uh, okay. um, any questions for the committee? Hearing none, uh, um, we'll proceed to the uh, uh, to the roll call vote and. Uh, so uh, have they been out? Is this something in addition to what they already have? Were they did without this? They, they, they did not. They did not have it. No. So they, if you recall, when we approved it, but there was a, uh, probably sixteen thousand in additional equipment that uh, PD requested for the mechanic shop, and it was approved months ago. This took forever to come in. Uh, the invoice was sent to the police department and never made it to me. Um, so the invoice is four months old at this point. So they came chasing and I said, well, I haven't seen it. it. Turns out it was sent to 88 Chestnut to my name and never made it to me. The remainder of the roughly 16,000 um, is a stainless steel table that has been on order now for approximately a year. And it was expected in March still no shipping but this isn't the first time we've run in if you recall metal shelves for the police department took 13 months before we got them so there's still despite what you hear about the supply chain there's still backups out there it's all within the budget correct correct it's all accounted for it just hasn't been paid yet any other questions or comments from the committee okay, hearing then we'll, we'll proceed to a roll call vote uh, Stuart? Aye. Lynn? Aye. George? Aye. Roy? Aye. Irwin? Aye. And the chair votes aye. I think that's sufficient. Finally, the, uh, we do have another school related uh, item in NC, a theater light and sound study. Might be uh, we don't yeah. have the Anvil, I think, on this one, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Anne is, Anne is yeah, here. Anne's here so. I'm here. Yeah. All right, we have a uh, 
uh, an invoice from uh, Pushot International for March 2023 services for design services in the amount of $13,168.75. The chair will so move. Is there a second? Thank you. Um, any questions or comments from the committee? Hearing none, we'll proceed to a, a roll call vote. Uh, Stuart? Aye. Yep. Lynn? Aye. George? Aye. Roy? Aye. Erwin? Aye. Ann? Aye. And the chair votes aye. And with that, it's Close to eight o'clock, so I think we can. Oh, we actually have one more invoice. Let's uh, finish that up first. And That's, various, and various. Great, excellent. This is the for the DPW study uh, invoice from Weston and Sampson in the amount of uh, eight thousand eight hundred dollars for March twenty twenty three services. <laughs> Chair will so move. Is there a second? second. Thank, thank you, George. Um, any questions or comments from the committee? Hearing none, uh, we'll proceed to the roll call vote. Uh, Stuart? Aye. Lynn? Aye. George? Aye. Roy? Aye. Erwin? Aye. And uh, Barry? Aye. Thank you. And the chair votes aye. And Ann. And Ann, sorry. Ann. Aye. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's right. Well, we got our support. Don't try those deals. Those are like seven. Thanks, Sam. You're trying to convince me. Thank you, thank you, user reps for for the school project, and we're going to proceed on to the library space utilization study. It's just about eight o'clock, so we're right on target. And so we we have two user reps here. Ken Hewitt and Earhart, thank you. Join us uh, up at the table, please. And then, right my go. Yeah, if you could, you could just join us up here too. All right, great. So you guys are voting members. You can sit over there. You want to sit over there? Yeah. We're going to all do today. I think that, and, and I have your. Oh, uh, great. I'm going to attempt the impossible, which is to everyone high price them so I can annotate them so it's fully possible to plan as well as possible. Okay. Um, before we begin, I'd like to maybe just uh, go around the table and introduce our, ourselves. So okay. if, if you like it. Um, actually, uh, we'll start with our guests. Would you please? Well, sure. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Brett Benson. Nice to meet you. Hi, Brett. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Claudia Forrest, and I am an associate at Yale. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ken Sargent, Senior Property Manager, Building Design and Construction. And Kevin Coffey, the Administrative Specialist in Building Design and Construction. And Director of Building Design and Construction. Welcome. I'm Richard Cream, Acting Chair tonight. And Manager. Where's Ken? Oh, so this thing. Aaron Gray, trustee for the library, and he's a representative here for Roy And Kim Hewitt, the director of the library. And uh, folks on the uh, on video, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself to Stuart and uh, Aaron? Say hello. <laughs> yeah. Are you guys is, asking for us? Sorry. I'm going to just say uh, Stuart is actually the chair of the committee. I'm, I'm Barry, I'm the director of facilities for the town. Yeah, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, great, sorry, there's a, hi, it's Stuart Chandler, chair of the committee, and I heard you say something, Richard, but uh, hopefully I've introduced, or we, I've been introduced. Excellent, thank you, thank you all very much. And uh, with that, uh, I'll turn the uh, mic over to- uh, Yes, and I'll do a very yes. brief introduction. We've already gone around the table. Um, as you know, uh, Part of the reason for having the meeting here tonight is because the study is uh, about the library. Um, those of you who have not been through the library recently, um, you're welcome to walk through after the meeting. Um, and perhaps you'll look at it uh, with fresh eyes and looking at some of the uh, concepts. Uh, Util has gone through the first two steps, which is uh, interviews, assessing existing 
uh, information uh, and uh, preparing a uh, online uh, feedback um, system of which uh, you'll be seeing some of the results of that information next night. So Brett, with that, I guess I'll turn it over to you. All right, and I won't be able to do the impossible which is to both operate Zoom and be here in person with you. So I'm just gonna wing it by being in person. Um, so Hank, thanks so much for that introduction. The one person who's missing from our team tonight is Marissa Peral. She's our project manager. She's calling up the sick kid tonight, so she can join us. Uh, but Hank, if you wouldn't mind going on to the, to the next one. Um, so the uh, tonight's agenda, you know, we're really gonna break it into three parts for you. We're There you go. May I have to share this with you? All right, hopefully, we're back in business for those who are online. Uh, okay, so then the second thing that we're doing is we're really trying to engage with you know, residents, with library patrons, with the staff, with the trustees, their parts of this type, the friends of the library, any other interested stakeholders. We really want to hear directly what the library does well, what needs to be expanded, and what's missing. And then thirdly, we're here to develop and then refine a concept to improve the library's layout. Um, we really want to have that layout be the library's needs for the next 20 years. Trying to make this both reactive to what we're hearing today, but also forward looking. Next one. So, in terms of the project schedule, uh, it's about approximately a four month process. We're uh, more or less in the middle of it. There's uh, four tasks on the design side. The first task was performing a facility assessment and kicking off our online survey, talking to some of the staff, having some focus groups, which we'll get into in a minute. Second task was developing a program for the library uh, and some testing some initial concept options. That's where we are today, the completion of that task. And what we're heading into in April is refining those concept options based on the information we hear from all of you tonight, uh, and then developing a preferred option with a cost estimate and a draft report. We'll be meeting with the library trustees on May 9th and then up with all of you again on June 5th. So this isn't the only time you'll be able to provide us with feedback. But we are hoping for some uh, great feedback from you tonight so we can develop one option with potentially some alternates uh, moving forward in the next couple of months. So we've really taken a kind of three pronged approach to gathering data and understanding some of the issues here at the library. So the first one has been direct observation. Um, we've walked around the library with uh, him and her and the staff. Uh, we've actually embedded ourselves in the library and worked uh, from this space just to have kind of uh, direct observation uh, and see how it works. 
we have this online survey. We have a QR code. If you find your mind wandering, feel free to take the survey while you're here. Um, and we're really trying to uh, broadcast that as widely as we can. We've translated it into four languages uh, so that everybody can participate. And then we've also had some focus group engagement sessions. So we've met with uh, age focus groups. We've met with the friends of the library, uh, really with a focus on the seniors using the space. We've met with tweens online. We've met with teens here at the library. We enticed them with pizza. Next one. So parents with small children are really helping through online surveys, given the time constraints and you know, knowing how difficult it is as a parent with small children myself, uh, that it is to you know, come to in-person meetings. Um, and we'll kind of show you some of the results we have in a minute. Are you talking to the, the school system too, see how, especially the high school, how they expect their students traffic to come over here and what the pressure they can occur? That's a good point. We haven't engaged directly with the high school yet. We've had a lot of high school students yeah. uh, and heard from them, but we haven't talked to the high school administration yet. Just understanding how they, like, their expectations about it, because like, the, the kids have used the library differently at different ages. Right. One is here every night, the other one is better. Right. So it's very different lab than the one. How many high school students participated in the we had about 25 or 30 students who participated, which you know was a good crowd. It was most of the kids were there that day um, when we were here. And we I'll show you some images of what it looked like, but we had three boards up. Um, we had a couple of pizzas and a card that we the library for providing those. And we walked around. Some people were, you know, very um, open to participate and they walked on their own. And some people we did a little enticement. So we all kind of Kim and I walked around at the different tables and to come up some business to come over and talk to us and put some sticky notes on some of the boards that we had. So I'm going to kind of summarize uh, some of the findings that we've had from each of these three approaches that we've had with engagement. Um, the first one uh, being our kind of direct uh, observation. I won't go through all of these in detail. I think you all have the PDF of this and we can leave it with you um, so you can study it in more detail. But just some highlights here. The children's area is, you know, honestly too small in some of its more specialized program areas. So what we're finding is that there's a story room and a craft room uh, that were part of the original design. Both of them are too small. The story hour happens in this space. Uh, it can't happen in the story room that was designed 17 years ago. Same issue with the craft room, it's just too small. Visibility is challenged, especially because this children's area is split and the stacks are on a higher level for a good half of the floor area and that visibility from the librarian's desk is challenged. We know that there are some drawbacks in this space. The kitchen pantry storage is pretty limited. The cabinetry is not ADA compliant. And then looking more at the general areas on the ground floor, there's somewhat limited visibility when you walk in from the entrance to seeing a librarian, which we think is really important when you walk in and make eye contact and get a question. But the large print fiction area, which is that image on the upper right, is the longest, seemingly endless corridor of books <laughs> that you can imagine. Um, and it's the lighting, while improved recently, is still challenging uh, for those who are looking for large print. And there's also no place to sit down when you're browsing. And we're fine. You know, we, we heard directly from some of the seniors and the friends of the library that when you're browsing and you're looking for a large print, you might also want to be able to just sit down and take a rest with some of the books. Um, and then overall storage is very challenged. For my part. And then on the second part, we go up one more slide. Okay. Um, you know, the, the biggest, probably most visible and uh, auditorily obvious is the teens are just woeful. The teen space is woefully inadequate. And it's so much so that when the teens do arrive, they kind of overspread the entire library. And that creates not only, you know, missed opportunities with the teens, but it also creates friction with many of the other users who are in the library at that time, uh, especially those who are looking for quieter spaces to be able to work or study or read. Uh, and so that's, you know, seems to be one of the primary issues that we need to address. The archive history genealogy is hidden away. Uh, it is in a, many of it is in a climate controlled space, but most people don't seem to know that that is a program that's available. And then again, in the general areas, you know, we have very limited visibility from the reference desk. 
to the Highland Street entrance. Um, the, the design of the desk itself is very intimidating. It's, you know, it's not welcoming, it's not friendly at all. Uh, and the study rooms, which are highly used, uh, are just you know, not up to the task of what people are looking for. Uh, and then finally, the, you know, the Wyeth and the Bosworth rooms are very beautiful, but they're also underutilized. Uh, and so we really like to kind of address a lot of these things. Next one. So just to give you a kind of brief summary of the online survey, we spent a lot of time working with Kim and Hank and trying to fine tune the questions. We wanted to make sure that the survey was brief so that people would take it um, and not get past, you know, go to the first page and then give up because something else is happening. So some of the findings, just to kind of talk about who is responding to our survey right now, we're seeing, you know, very broad uh, interest within the kind of, I'd say, 30 to 60 year old demographic. That more or less mirrors the demographics of Edom as a whole. Um, it's a little heavier skewed towards that kind of 30 to 60 population than overall. Um, and then in the age range for households, so we ask people if you're if you're responding to the survey, what age uh, do you have people in your household? What we're seeing is there are quite a few uh, people responding who have you know, kids under 19. Uh, so almost 45%, and that's just a little bit more skewed towards the, uh, the average the demographics of households with kids. Uh, next, and I'll, the one thing I'll say is we have 236 responses so far, so we really encourage all of you to share the survey with your friends and your neighbors and try to spread this as widely as we possibly can. Just to give you some snapshots on uh, what we're seeing so far, so we've asked people about programming in the children's area. And, when, and the questions that we've asked, we've paired them with images on the right. Sorry, they're a little small on this one, they're bigger on the actual survey. And we've asked people to rank them between very important, important, or not important. Um, and we found in other surveys that we've run that this kind of gives us a good sense of what people are interested in without um, having to rank them. We don't want people to you know, have a choice of only one through eight. We really want people to identify if they're top choices and we to do it. So what you can see here is that the two most popular ones are age appropriate furniture and areas for story time within the children's library area. So those are in the orange bars. That's the very important. The gray bar is the not important. So it's kind of almost uniform consensus that those are important items. And then following closely behind that are uh, dedicated play spaces, uh, dedicated areas for arts and crafts, uh, and then bathrooms that have both child and adult size fixtures. And then we're seeing, you know, some more kind of varied responses to some other programs like the sensory room, which is more specialized, uh, and stroller park. Next one. We also asked people about programming for caregivers. We had identified uh, caregivers who are bringing kids to the library as potentially an audience um, to provide programming for people, you know, while the kids are maybe doing story hour or craft activity, would we reach caregivers? We're kind of seeing mixed results really uh, in the responses that we've received so far. Uh, I think a lot of people kind of rank some of these choices as important. So providing uh, spaces, sorry, the kids are a little hard to read for me from this distance, that must be for all of you too, um, but providing uh, spaces for programming for caregivers uh, that is either separate or attached to the children's area, providing uh, language learning materials and that sort of thing. Again, we're getting kind of mixed results. You see the gray bars are not important. Uh, and so we're, we'll leave that open for more survey responses before we draw any conclusions, but we'd also love to hear your feedback on that tonight. Uh, next one, thanks. So these, yeah. are from, these are from all survey takers. That's exactly right. Yes. yes. So you might not actually be hearing the from the from the, care, yeah. the, from the caregivers yeah. themselves. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, we're also, you know, surveyed people on tween programming. Uh, very important uh, in terms of the response so far are spaces for individual reading. And that was actually backed up by the uh, tweets that we talked to themselves. And then also larger communal spaces. Uh, those were hopefully important. <clears throat> and then following behind that, a little more mix was uh, dedicated tween spaces that is separate from children's and teens. Although when we spoke with the tweens themselves, they all said that that was important. 
and actually get to consider the same thing too. They want to get to answer the next one. Next slide. Uh, one point. Then we surveyed some of the teams. Uh, so similar types of responses. So individual spaces for reading and studying was very important. Uh, also smaller and closed study areas for groups of um, teams to be able to work on homework or other projects together, followed closely by access to specialized technology tools like the 3D printer. Uh, and then access to computers with specialty programs like 3D modeling software. Thanks. I'm going to ask that question yeah. again. But like you, you didn't say I'm a team and then it gave me these questions or? No, this is for everybody. So then we're, right. we're going to follow this up with the focus groups that we oh, had okay. as well. Okay. So to, to kind of I think it's important for my kid to have this, but my kid wants to lecture. <laughs> right, yeah. exactly. exactly. Yeah. I mean, I think you might see that actually in the uh, second from the right answer which is we asked about a space for gaming. And that was, I would actually say it was kind of mixed among the teenagers, but you can see on the respondents, we might be getting some of the parents saying, yeah, I really don't want to be the system. Right. We might have other respondents sending out things. Yeah, no, I just was curious if it was separate. Thank yeah. you. Uh, keep going. Thank you. We also asked about uh, general spaces for uh, the adult population um, and really trying to ask for what types of spaces are missing in the library. And so the, the rankings here, we've underlined the important ones. Again, I'm sorry, it's so small. I can, I can actually see these. I kind of know okay. all of them, but I, I'm feeling like for all of you who are trying to read that at the same time. <laughs> uh, so small meeting spaces were the number one choice, and that kind of backs up with the uh, observations that we've had just being in the library and talking to some of the focus groups uh, space for outdoor space is also right behind that in terms of being a very important missing component in the library, uh, followed closely by behind by quiet uh, rooms, areas dedicated to remote work, and then interestingly, a maker space where we talk about having three printers and that sort of thing. We also have, we, you know, have a fill in the blank portion on that survey question as well, and we've added some here as well, for example, a dedicated nursing area um, for those who are expressing help um, when they're here in the library. Um, and then on the bottom, we love the library, don't change a thing. Um, there are always a couple of those. <laughs> so then we, you know, in addition to the survey and plus our kind of direct observation, we had some group engagement sessions. Um, we had a walking tour of the library with the friends of the library with it. We asked them to um, bring folks who would have a kind of focus on senior engagement um, and how they use the library. So we walked through all of the spaces uh, with that group. We got some really um, great feedback. We engaged with tweens that was virtually through Zoom. Uh, and we had, I think, probably 10 tweens engaged in that. Um, and then we engaged with the teens through our pizza party here upstairs, and we'd set up front boards. And hey, maybe if you zoom out just a touch, we, could, we have a picture of that over on the uh, upper right side of the slide. We set up boards. We gave everybody little green sticky notes um, so that they could put down a dot, a green dot on the types of spaces that were interesting to them. Um, we had little post it notes also where people could jot down notes for the types of spaces that they were looking um, we did get, you know, some, some great feedback as we summarized here on the left. Um, just one funny thing is the tweens asked for beanbag chairs, and the teens said, we don't want any dumb middle school beanbag chairs. So I think that checked out in terms of the age group that's so here. Um, on the next slide. So oh, yeah. do you have any interaction about how any of the younger folks use the snacks? Like, do they come with their own? Are they doing everything online? Have you talked about decanting to make room for the rest of this? We have talked about that kind of uh, internally in terms of really looking carefully at the collection. And Kim, maybe you can probably talk a little bit more about that. We've talked about sight lines, which is very much correlated yep. to shelving. Yep. And we've talked about how kids are accessing you know, making sure they're within the reach range, both for the children who are in the space and the caregivers right. who are in multiple ages. Yeah, so 
it's definitely uh, it's a big chunk of our current footprint is our YA materials, um, but that is not true of the circulation. So we're looking very closely at what our ordering <coughs> habits are there, how do we shift them, to, you know, how to engage more with the question. But again, what Brett kind of spoke to before is that because there's not like an area for teens, there's nowhere for the teen librarian to really be to engage with them around that literature. So um, I think we'd see some increase with just the collection that we have, yeah. but we definitely need to make it smaller. All right, so we put down some key takeaways here uh, based on all of the engagement that we've done so far. I'm just going to read through all of them because I think they're all pretty important. Um, the first one is, you know, quieter reading areas throughout the library and a greater sense of separation between the young adult area and making sure that it's adequate for size uh, and the rest of the library. Uh, number two is providing multi-use spaces or a space for 15 to 20 people for skill classes um, and then also providing additional study rooms so that people can meet in smaller groups. <clears throat> Having an improved circulation and reference desks, uh, both to enhance visibility to the entrances and throughout the library, but also just to make it more approachable so that the, there are fewer barriers between the patrons and the staff. Um, we heard a lot about uh, having dedicated food areas, uh, including some seating and maybe some potential vending opportunities. Question yeah, that. who said that? Um, What's the age group? All Everyone. ages. Yeah. Everyone all the yeah. time. Yeah. We've seen more and more food of the library as a group. So let's respond to that with this take the coffee and donut, <laughs> like wherever they're going. Is it do we want it? I well, I think it's probably we want to think about when we say dedicated, we are thinking more about uh, the attributes we would need to make it successful. So having a flooring that's not carpeting, having appropriate furniture, vending machines, having, a, service. having vending machines, that sort of thing. But not 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 allowing people to bring coffee into the rest of the library. I think that what we've talked about is that people can bring in coffee if they want to, they can bring their own snacks and that sort of thing. And that we would want to match the furniture in, in the seating areas to all of those things like the hard right. floor and acceptance services and that sort of thing. Yeah, I'd like to I'd like to add into that if I could. Um, that really got me. I, I have a pet peeve with food in that area anywhere there, given the nature of it. But what was interesting in your survey is that every survey that had an association or a question to food, a high percentage was not important. So that's why I, I one pet peeve, that's a personal issue. I really I would fight against food there and a dedicated food area. I mean, for, for adults that are doing a special event, we have the room that you're in now to be able to do something. But if you go back to, it might be interesting if you flip back to your studies, <clears throat> your bar charts, I think almost every single question that was answered relative to food had the highest non-important relative to all the other topics. Yeah, I think that's a good point, Stuart. So the, we did ask specific questions for the children's tweens and teens. And then there was a relatively high number of not important in those categories, meaning we shouldn't think of a dedicated space for children's eating or a dedicated space for tweens and teens and so on. And so what we've tried to think about is having a, a, a more centralized space where people can gather and it's okay to have food, but not to kind of atomize it throughout the library uh, within each collection. Yeah, and I think the hard part is, is that, that for what it's worth, or from my own opinion, I don't find many people, especially the younger generations, really care about picking up after themselves. And you're just introducing more things that just get trashed around and a behavior that I think we can't necessarily change. So I would be interested to see as we move along on this, where that if we had a library that had another you know, 600 to 1,000 square feet somewhere in it or attached to it, I could see like a cafe, which would be kind of neat. But with the space you have there, I'd rather see more like the uh, space above you now is an area that I think is of high interest. I think even your survey kind of talked a bit about more study areas and group areas. Um, and the rooms off to the side from the 
desk, a reference desk, I think too, um, probably would be used more if that was more conducive. Um, but anyways, just my thoughts. So I would just say food is already allowed in the library. Um, and so we have several spaces that we have said, this is a meeting area because we don't really want it on the carpet. We would like to encourage people to do it, you know, where if they have a spill, it's okay to clean up. Um, and luckily our custodians are really amazing about that. Um, I think we're never going to live in a world where teens don't bring in their food. Um, so we're trying to find places for them to be where it's not a nuisance to everyone else in the building. And also for story times for infants and children, um, you know, even some staff have had similar feelings as Stuart. Um, but, you know, and I'll say, well, they can wait till they get to the car after story time. And no, they cannot. Um, so we want to have, you know, really welcoming spaces for families. Um, and I think it's just important to have those areas kind of designated throughout the library as they are now, or maybe build out, you know, even if we just added chairs out there now, that's the space people can meet already. And that's the whole point of what you're talking yeah. about, which is sort of making it welcoming to all, but also allowing kids to be kids. I mean, and keeping it out of the you staff. You want them to right? be here, but you don't necessarily yeah. want them spilling on nobody who's here being in the corner. Right. So, right. yeah. So I mean, I, so um, you know, my my thinking is 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 a little different than Stewart's. I, I think you make it as flexible as possible. You want to be here, you want to use it. I can tell you, I worked on my dissertation here not that many years ago, and I came. I mean, it was five, six, seven hours in a row. I didn't want to go across. I didn't want to take a break. I wanted to get it done, and I would bring food in, and I would, and I'd have a soda or something like that. You know. And nobody gave me a hard time. It was it was easy. And, I, and I, the point about cleaning up, I totally respect. That, that opinion, and I, I realize that's a strategy, and you know, making sure the services work and the other things work. But I want it to be welcoming, like uh, everybody says. And um, but, we have to look at the behaviors we're going to have people, people, and we want but, to encourage people to be here and work from home, which is right. what we're seeing now, yeah. and that's not going to go away. So, if we want to be the place for people to come and be, mm -hmm. right, because it's the only free place to come and be. And work for five or seven hours without buying something <clears throat> you could bring your snack with you or your lunch or but i would i agree with Stuart that yeah. you know if you've got an extra 500 to a thousand square feet i would put it to the maker space which mm -hmm. is going to be a draw for students of all ages yeah. as opposed to a cafe where somebody's grabbing a brioche and a coffee like i think we have to just be really strategic about what that looks and feels like because the draw is different for different people um need to touch all groups in one way or another. Totally. Yeah. yeah. I, I think all of your comments are really well heard. I think um Stuart, Stuart Roy, Roy, sorry, I'm going at everybody's name. Um you touched on a really important point, which is that there is a missing demographic that is an important audience for the library right now, which is as Tim said the work from home demographic. And that is increasingly, you know, people who are in their 20s to whatever fill in the blank age. Maybe they don't have kids, maybe they do, but they're looking for a space to work that is not in their home, not in their apartment, but that is comfortable <laughs> and that you can spend long amounts of time and be able to have a coffee or have a snack and then let you work. Yeah. And that's an important audience that the library just is not set up to reach right now. So what we imagine. Yeah, and oh, apologize. I, I don't, just um, quickly, um, one is. I think the food issue more to me is about the younger generations and the behavior around that. I think it'd be great for a study room or an area to be able to do it and make it conducive to food. I think, um, Roy, I, th I didn't even think about that, you know, in terms of people doing dissertations want quiet time and they want, you know, a coffee or whatever that makes sense. And maybe that's just my bias is that the younger generations, I just don't think really care this day and age and don't treat it as well. And that's something we have to contend with. But back to your point about demographic, um, I would I would question the remote people working remote. I think it would be great, but do you really want people doing Zoom calls in the middle of the library? And I mean, think how many people are having phone conversations um, in trains and automobiles and excuse me, in planes. I think we'd have to think through the remote people. I think if there's a way to create some rooms where you can lock off the noise, that would be great. So I'd be interested in how you address that demographic and what you really are trying to accommodate for that demographic of the remote workers. 
think you're trying to get away from the people on Zooms, right? I mean, like when my kids were home during break from college, I said, go to the library to study. They said, there's no place to go. Like, there's no place where you can actually sit in a room and be quiet and have a cup of coffee and spend six hours with your books open. Right. Because you're either in a stack with no place to sit or or, you know, the teens or are you're in the they're, teens and yeah. they're kind of talking and yappy yappy. So like for the last 10 years, my kids were never at the library because there's no place to come that's comfortable for that age group between 18 and 25. And I think the plan that they put together really can speak to that with additional study room spaces, yeah, small like, meeting room spaces, and things like that to, to hit all of those kind of things. But one of the big things for me is like kind of the quieter areas, all of those are sort of facilitated in some way by having a different team space situation. Right. Um, that helps all of this kind of flow. Yeah. One thing I'll say about the team areas is that we really see it as the program that doesn't exist right now. And it's combined with many <laughs> other missing programs. So the work from home crowd. Um, multi generational spaces, so right. a space where a caregiver or a grandparent or a parent can be with the kid, not necessarily in the children's area or the teen area. But what we're trying to do with these plans is locate these few areas in the kind of transition zone so that we can gather a lot of different types of people and have a more comfortable space to occupy, but also a different kind of space to use the library that exists right now. So then, my last, the last takeaway here was enhancing accessibility to the collections and to the programs in the library. And that's both through better space planning, it's, but it's also through better lighting and, and better furniture choices. All right, thanks. This might be a little challenging in uh, this format, but I'm gonna do my best to kind of walk you through our three options that we've developed, starting with um, the existing floor plans, which we've color coded here. We're looking at the ground floor plan uh, we're in the purple space in the upper left corner um, right now, where most of us are in the community room. And off uh, to the uh, and east to the right is the general collection. So there's the fiction plus the large print along that uh, back wall across from the windows. And then the children's area is that kind of yellow orange color, uh, depending which screen you're looking at, uh, on the bottom of the plan. Upstairs, we'll go to the next one. It's primarily the general collection. Uh, there's a big stretch of computers right down in the center in line with the Highland entrance. And then the team area is in the closed room in the upper left. It's in the team stacks deep out into that space. Because of the built in millwork and the, the arrangement of the team space, it's almost unusable. You can get maybe eight people if everybody's packed in. But you know what we're, we were seeing here you know, on the days of the year. Get 40 teenagers in the space easily, and if that space is just not enough to accommodate that. On the right hand side of the plan is where the genealogy and the archive space is, and then in the front we have the wire and the boss programs. I would mind going to our first option. Can I, can I ask a question yes. before you start? Um, I'm curious if when you're saying this, I looked at the pictures, I couldn't figure it out, is how much we're reducing the amount of stacks area in each model right and, and and how and i don't know if the library itself is looking at how aggressive they can be about reducing them and not to reduce resources that's not what i'm saying um but to replace it with other resources because if you want to talk about maker space or other things are there some more bold ways we can go and support that and i realize that might have a different cost but right. building costs might have a digital cost so but as, the, as you look at three plans i'm curious how much you all of the same reduction in stacks or no reduction in stacks. So I'm curious about that. So we're still working through all of those details. Uh, and part of that is we'll be involved in the details of our next step as we try to refine these. And that's fine. That's yeah. Fine. And I think you know the way to think of this is probably somewhere between a bubble diagram thinking about where the big pieces go and a more fleshed out option. Um, our goal really is to try to more or less keep the same collection count that we have, maybe with the exception of the children's area where we're gonna look more carefully at the uh, collection count, uh, but try to be more thoughtful and more strategic about where uh, things are located and how we can you know, squeeze more efficiency out I of this. I would say that's a huge decision at this point, the collection count. And what, and I don't know how you validate that exactly in terms of what out data on utilization and other things that make sense. 
but you'll, you'll withdraw set. And you don't want to have a library of notebooks. I'm not suggesting that, but I am suggesting that. Right? So, I'd, I'd be curious to have that conversation later in this process. Okay. <laughs> Um, the other, you know, levers that we pull when we start doing space planning with libraries is, is the height of the stacks and thinking about, you know, where we where important sight lines are so that the stacks are a little bit lower and where we can get a little bit taller in that sort and then combined with the uh, age and, and user profile and the access of that collection. Did you look at the structure too? Yeah, so the good news is. Um, 90% of this space is new and uh, the structure hasn't changed in 17 years. It's just really the uses that have changed and the distribution of the books that we expect to be in good shape uh, for that. Uh, so we have three options. We've kind of organized them into maybe uh, from lesser to greater degrees of uh, ambition. And that kind of translates into impact to library operations, thoughts about phasing, certainly budget. Um, and so we're gonna show you all three of these starting with the probably the least um, impactful change, or excuse me, the least um, costly change, I should say, as, as our starting point. We're calling it kind of incremental change. Uh, so you'll see from this plan that on the ground floor, Major pieces stay more or less where they are. The children stays where it is. The community room where we are stays where it is. The general collection more or less stays where it is. There are some important differences. Um, one is that when you walk in the front door, you really want to make it more open and inviting. And so we're thinking of removing some of those glass doors and changing that lounge furniture that's there into a food welcome space with cafe type scene, as well as a laptop bar oriented along the glass wall. So that it, that is really a kind of uh, vibrant, bustling location right when you walk in so that it feels like there's a, a, a good hum of activity happening in the library. A lot of the use that's happening with the lounge furniture out, right, out there right now, which is a kind of waiting point for pickups and drop-offs can still be accommodated in the space, but we think it'll be more flexible and and useful with a different setup of furniture. We also want to make the circulation desk a little bit more forward of the space so that as you walk in that front door, you can make eye contact with the library. Um, so that means pushing the desk forward. And by doing that and also consolidating it a little bit, we make room behind that just below where the number one is for two new spaces. And so one is a, a multi purpose classroom, that space where 15 to 20 people can meet. You can have adult education classes. You can have a larger meeting, but not as large as a community room. It's really a flexible space, and it's located very near to the front door. And then also a sensory room. And this one, we did get some mixed results in the survey, but again, that survey is asking all respondents. Um, the sensory room you know, is more specialized, but it reaches a population that probably is not very comfortable in the library right now, given how open it is and difficult it is to control the environment. So I think it's an important um, program component from an equity perspective. Um, beyond that, you know, there's some reorganization of the children's space that we'll be more thoughtful about as the option uh, gets more developed. Um, but we have consolidated the uh, story room and the craft room into one larger, more flexible space. And so that could be programmed for some story at work uh, programming, it can be reconfigured with seating for craft activities. There would be sinks to support that and a whole wall of closets to move furniture in and out to make it more flexible. So if the craft activity is over, they can roll the tables and chairs into the closets and then open them up story out. Um, and then looking on the upper right side of the plan where it says general, we've relocated the workroom a little bit further along the path just so that we can have more space uh, for the circulation up front. Uh, and then there's an office and some storage space there as well. And then beyond that, the fiction collection. They go up to the second floor. And then, so on the second floor, you can see that the team space is really expanded from uh, that upper left corner and includes a new tween space uh, dedicated to tweens as well as a tween collection. Uh, we have two flexible spaces for the teens. One, uh, it is enclosed in that room and it's more of a kind of uh, gaming lounge. 
Uh, but we can also talk about you know, having other maker type activities in there as well. Right now, it's just a room on a plan. That value. Um, and then the general collection um, is more or less where it is. We have consolidated the computers under to over the skylight space. And in talking with him and the staff, it seems like we can reduce the uh, seat count of the computers, just given the way technology access has changed. Um, and then Wi Fi is more prolific throughout the library and laptops are available for people to check out. And then on the lower left corner of the plan, we've added more study rooms. So there are currently four, but there's actually only really three because the fourth one is being used as an office space. So what we what we want to do is open that back that fourth one back up and accommodate the office space elsewhere. And we've added where the current reference desk is a larger study room. So we have eight seats in there, and that's really uh, a missing piece in the library right now where you have a group of eight people meet. We've moved that reference desk more front and center. So that when you walk in the Highland entrance, you can look through the existing building and make eye contact with the library and upstairs as well. We think that's really important. And we've moved some of the uh, genealogy collection to the uh, Bosworth room and make room for uh, the workroom space uh, in its place, just to the right of the uh, reference space. So that's our first option. We think. All of this is incremental. We can we you know imagine in our head a phasing scenario that doesn't disrupt library operations too heavily. Um, and we've kind of start, started talking with Hank and thinking about how that would happen. We go to option two, which is a little more invasive, a little more ambitious. Yeah, okay, please. Got a question. Yes. So I don't know how you, if you can talk to the order of Dr. Harris, but it seems like you're adding all these good spaces. Only have the same physical space in the building. Is there some way to show what is being lost or condensed or modified to create these opportunities? Yeah, that's a good point. And that's something that we should do is have a kind of a, a graphic and, a, and some quantitative analysis of what's getting denser, what's getting more efficient, and what's being added. We have done that in kind of in earnest uh, in our internal programming, but we don't have a graphic here to explain that we should we will do that for the next meeting. You know, very much Dr. Casey, uh, Dr. Staff's uh, space is shifted or is it, is it less? Or is it we're, we're shifting the space, we're densifying it just a little bit. Um, we're trying to consolidate where we can, but we also want to carve out storage space that doesn't exist right now. So in a way, the, the workrooms, if you go back there, are kind of the de facto storage areas because there isn't any other place to put things. We're trying to be uh, more uh, intentional about creating storage space that's adequate that has the right amount of shelving, and then have workspace that is actually functional as workspace. I was just going to ask from the back, like, who's using the computers because they're awfully close to the space and like building Who's volunteered that they use that? We see, like, probably I would say mostly adults over the age of 20 or 30 using it. Yeah. It just feels like a tight it's adjacency. A tight it's a tight agreement. adjacency yes. if you're yeah. Yeah, over 20. Yes. Yeah. And we've, we've thought about that. The benefit of having the computers, well, so in our kind of idea of this being an incremental change, computers come with a lot of power requirements. Exactly. And so that can become future something, but it, you know, we have we've anchored them against the wall, so it's very easy to provide power there. And they become floating in the space. We start thinking about floor boxes, and then we start thinking about electricity over to them. And so we've tried to be in this version, thinking about it where it can be anchored to the wall or with some existing floor box locations. There just aren't that many in the space right now. We have put the young adult librarian between the computer area and the teams just to act as a kind of gatekeeper for that space. But I agree that we, you know, that's not the best adjacency. And there's pros and cons for each one of these. Uh, so why don't we move on to option two? I know I'm probably drawing on in my a lot of time. So I'm sorry to keep you. Um, so option two uh, is an attempt to get all of the younger patrons of the library on one floor. 
So in this option, we are putting, keeping the children where they are, and we're bringing the teen and the tween collection down to the ground floor. The community room space where it is, and the children's space, the combined story and craft space stays as we are showing in option one. The difference is when you walk in, you know, we think of, well, we would have that kind of bustling cafe work from the library space. We have large print on the ground floor, which, you know, is a good, is a big positive being able to have large print near parking um, for patients who are looking for it. It's also adjacent to a lounge area so that those who are getting large print have a place to sit down. And then we put teens and tweens uh, somewhat in their own area so that their impact on the use of the space is a little bit more contained, uh, but they certainly have more room to spread out within that space in that small corner that we've seen in the, uh, as it exists right now. Let's go up to the second floor. So on the second floor, this now becomes entirely general collection. So no uh, mixing of age groups. Uh, it's really kind of free reign of books and seating for the adult collections. We've been able to create uh, four study areas plus that multi-purpose classroom, which is where the number one is. Um, so that can serve as a multiple reading type space. We've included more cafe type seating on, off of the Highland entrance in the center there. And then just like in option one, we've moved the reference desk right front and center so that you can make eye contact with the library as you're walking in. And then just to the right of that would be the work for the library staff. Let's go to option three. So option three is the more uh, radical change. And in this, we're kind of you know, taking the library and we're shaking everything up and we're relocating things on different floors. Uh, so what we've created here is we've looked at putting most of the adult general collection on the lower level. Um, and what that does is it allows us to create a new loop around this bathroom floor. So from the community room, there will be a hallway down to the multi-purpose classroom, which is off the left. A lot of new storage, both for that multi-purpose room and new storage for the community room, which is sorely needed. And then the general collection in place of uh, where the children's area is now, that would be largely stacked, but there are some windows where we can have some uh, reading carols for that quiet uh, reading area that people are looking for collection. And then in this option, we're moving the archives to the basement level. So in that area where the children's stacks are now, uh, in the back in the raised low headroom area, we move the archives there. And that frees up some really valuable space upstairs. And then I'll, before we move upstairs, you know, just like in the other two options, we push that uh, circulation desk right up front and center so that when you walk in the Rosemary entrance, you can be a librarian. We have a workroom for them directly off of that. And then the fiction collection off to the plan right now. Um, let's move upstairs. So one thing that we've added in this option is a new stair. Uh, by bringing the children's, the tweens, and the teens upstairs, there is a more limited amount of adult collection uh, on the second floor. And so we think that it would be useful to have a stair to, to connect what's left of the general collection on the second floor with the bulk of the collection on the first floor. So I'm going to start with the adult collection upstairs. In this option, we've created, you know, just like some of the other options, we have five new meeting rooms. Those are off to the left as well as the computer zone in that, in that area. So that really becomes a kind of quiet study area, um, an area for computer use, which tends to be more kind of individuals at computers and quieter work uh, all off to the left. We still we keep that central reference desk off of Highland Avenue so that you can uh, make eye contact again. Um, but also, if you come in off of Highland, you can talk to a librarian if you're looking for something downstairs, the stair is right there. So it's very convenient to be able to go down and access other parts of the collection. And then walking beyond that, there's the stair that takes you, the existing stair that takes you downstairs to the Rosemary entrance. And then on the right side of that double height space, the walkway where the gallery is now, and that provides you the access to all of the young, uh, younger patron programming. So on the left, we have the children's area, and in place of the teen room that's there now, 
that's our story area graph room, uh, which is about the same size as the other options we've been showing. We have a dedicated play area with a mural and a skylight. And then off to the right, we have the tweens and then gradating into the teens on the far right. So the teens get their own space, they have access to natural light, but they're also a little bit crowded. So they feel like they're, you know, have separate space, but also kind of well monitored with their coming and going by the children's desk and then the young adult desk in the back as well. Just a, one of the things I never realized is I knew where the, the, the kids area was, but I just thought everything else was shared space. I didn't know that maybe that's how it was designed previously. I would just go in and find most of the places place to sit, whether it was at the light or quiet or whatever I wanted. This feels much more segregated. Is that just a person's like if I come in and I want to sit in the teen area, mm -hmm. I feel like this area kind of here. You probably wouldn't sit in the teen area when there's teens there. Uh, and I think the library well, what would happen to me is I'd be here all day. So I'd sit and it, right. it would become a teen and I'd just stay where I was. Like, right. you know, and now and then they would sit with me, now and then they would. Right. And I think that's really the result of how the library was planned 17 years ago and the, the inadequacy of the teen space that's up there now. And you know, I think it's a good example of some of the friction that we've seen between different age groups that are using the library. The, the teen space, I do think, will be, it could be open in the hours that they're not there, you know, we talked about that with Kim. Uh, I think the, the overarching goal, though, really is to try to give them a space that feels both their own, but it's well monitored. That seems to be the trick for teenagers. Um, the space is open. As David suggests, that works better. Like, in, like in yeah, words. yeah, it, it definitely works better. They they feel like they they have ownership over it, so there's more taking care of it. Uh, but you know, oversight is also important. Be concerned about families bringing their children like those in Florida. There'd be a lot of uh, parents and children trying to get up to that second floor at yeah. the same time. We've, um, we have definitely, like a stroller in the middle. We've uh, definitely talked about that as one of the drawbacks of this option. Is that for those who are parking in the Rosemary lot, that it's more of a trek uh, to get upstairs, especially, you know, even if you don't have strollers, getting kids and all this stuff upstairs is hard. Uh, it is more accessible to when you park in the Highlands, uh, but I know that the town doesn't own that, but uh, it's being leased for the benefit of the library. So that's definitely a, a drawback to this one. And during the, during the week, um, begin to not understand that they might park in the upper lot uh, because there is a, a ramp that comes to the front door. So people would have to change their habits in terms of that. But really, I, mean, I, I would, you know, I like the idea of the second stairs, but it's going to cost a ton of money and it takes square footage away. And we've already said the square footage is a problem. So well, it's a, I understand why you're putting it in this model, you know, thinking about it. I've never felt that it was hard to get from one floor to the other here. I never felt inconvenienced by that. Other than my term. So Hank, maybe if you would go to the next slide. Uh, we just have, you know, this is our last slide, the kind of you know summary slide. We'd love to get it's been great to have all of your feedback so far. I don't know if you have some final thoughts or directions for us as we move into the next phase. So we talked about outdoor space, but I felt like there were some yeah, you're right. Option three. Um, I agree with Roy that we should look really carefully at the floor plate to try and avoid an extra stair for all the reasons I just described. But I felt like the third option really hit that outdoor space mm -hmm. and the accessibility to that outdoor space that it was a big high demand. Was, it was like yeah. the second yeah. most important thing to people. Yeah, I'm sorry for that mention of that. We actually have outdoor space in two options. And Hank, sorry to make you do this, but if you would back up to option two on the ground floor, we've incorporated it on the lower left area off the children's. Uh, and having an outdoor space that it could be directly accessible for the children's area would be incredibly useful for the library to be able to, you know, number one, let kids just blow off some steam outside. That would be excavated from the hillside. So you know, we would have 
good guardrails to keep kids in and keep people from, you know, outside of the library from coming in. Um, we think they can give a great benefit. And then in option three, hey, if you go to the second floor of option three, there is a space where the number three is that the town owns that could be connected to the, there's an emergency stair um, that we could create a raised terrace, um, a kind of outdoor reading terrace. It could be really beautiful. It's north facing, so it would be useful in the summertime when you want relief from the heat, but maybe not great in some of the shoulder seasons where it's cooler and it'd be nice to have some sun. But that's kind of the fact of the building that we're working with. This one really needs to be paired with a more uh, aggressive approach to the archive space because the archives are that barrier between the main space of the library and where that outdoor space. So if we're interested in that outdoor area, we would want to relocate the archives. Yeah. Um, who's your neediest uh, people for the uh, services of the uh, desk? Uh, you know, so you know, one of the questions I sometimes I think that people who come in to use uh, fixed computers uh, might need more help with them. Mm -hmm. So you know, a couple of models are kind of far away. Right. Like, who 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 do you want the uh, library team to be closest to? Um, like you made a much more vision. I think that's one. I don't think like that. But I don't know if that's something that we need exploration. I think about when I just saw the fixed computers far away. Just like this way, the problem that you're going to walk over to the desk and you're going to walk over. Yeah, maybe. I don't know if you want to. Yeah. Um. I think right now it is nice that it's there so close for sure. Um. But the lines of sight are really key. So you you know like. In option three, you have the visual like alley there, kind of, so people can see, like the staff at the desk can see if someone's struggling or if someone's starting to get up, they can kind of go over to meet them. Um, just, I don't want to make more work for the Well, it's just it's it's like it's never gonna you're never gonna make every <laughs> group happy, really. Um, but this is something that you know many libraries deal with is having to have the computers far away from the desk for whatever reason. And I think people are as needy as they are close. So the further away they get, the more self-sufficient sometimes. There you go. Um, and so, yeah, it's not a major concern. I also think um, we're downsizing the number of stations because they don't typically have use. And even right now, we are starting to sort of downsize and make it more laptop bar because that's where the outlets are. But I think ultimately what we'll see is just a dwindling usage of these computers since we have the laptops circulating and things. People like to take those around the building even or take them home. Uh, so I, I don't see it as a major issue. Yeah. Well, just build the flexibility so you can right. it over time. Right. 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 And I think the multi-use space is so important because we want to be able to bring laptops in there to have classes to instruct those people on how to set up an email account, how to do this or do that. Like, I mean, you know, you think everyone's very comfortable with computers and the internet, and yet many of our patients are impacted by the loss of Internet Explorer. So, you know, we'd like to have those classroom opportunities, and we don't have that in our current building. Yeah, yeah. the hour is getting late, so I think we yeah. probably need to wrap up. Right there. Thank you very much for your presentation. It's so great. Um, is there anything that you need from our community at this point? Well, it's been great feedback so far. Um, and, you know, maybe I'll ask Hank to, you know, help filter for us and, and give us some guidance and maybe, you know, uh, I see you've already actively taking notes. Thank you. We have, re we have recorded the uh, discussion, but the next step is to winnow this down for for direction. So what I'd ask you all to do is to think about this and email me um, preferences or further questions uh, so that we can give that feedback to the team. Uh, they're not going to go through and uh, cost estimate all three options. But I think the, I think from a programmatic point of view, you really have to air the advantages and disadvantages of each scheme. And these this pros and cons sheet also articulates some of that. So, um, could even come back on the 25th mm -hmm. um, if necessary, uh, if you thought that was helpful.
to um, then get your general reactions and try to come to consensus about a particular option or a, or a hybrid of the different ideas. I we didn't really go over the pros and cons that much, but I, I'd like the opportunity to do that at home. Yeah. And, and so I think coming back on the 25th and spending maybe a half hour discussion on pros and cons and in ballpark numbers, That's fine. I, I think we can ask you to do a detailed process on page three. But if you could come back with a this is in the ballpark of this, this is in the ballpark of this, and, and so as we look at pros and cons, we can say you know, maybe better to spend this much because we get so much more. So, I agree with that. I, I feel like you can do the softer areas and say. Yeah. And then the, the other thing uh, in terms of if changes are made in the future, they can't all be made at once because we are not going to shut the library down. So there would have to be some fit, some type of phasing that goes on to accomplish this. Yeah, so um, I at least feel like it didn't deal with it. I'm not the right person to ask this question to. All right, right? Because I'm not I'm not a heavy user of a public library, for example, I just look at this time, but um, would we ever maybe when we narrow this down and do some more have an open forum where we would get more community feedback about the these designs that you know so that we're sure we're in the right direction from the users that are there. We did that. remember when we were so it, this is as political but when we were looking at that we, when we before we could do hillside uh or move hillside over to Savina, we presented them with all the options that we had this big community meeting of course every parent carried them um but uh, i don't know if there's a chance to do that um certainly we could take this and post it um Emma, i don't know if you would want, even want to post it onto the uh, library website, or have you previously posted it as part of the, a survey? Uh, we, yeah, absolutely, we have, and we, you know, have uploaded the video to YouTube so that people can can watch it very conveniently. Uh, there are a lot of ways to do you know, some online engagement. We can certainly, you know, talk about the effort of you know, what it would take to bring everybody in and have a big, a larger discussion. And if I need to say this, this is great. Thank you so much for all of this. Work. You know, I, I, I'm asking a lot of questions. Um, and I worry about putting out anything that's on the site that people can interpret in a way you don't want them to. Right. Um, so I'm not saying that, I'm just saying if there's an opportunity to say to the people, you know, if you, hey, Tuesday night, we're going to invite the community meeting, we're going to have a few tables around this room, we're going to show you some options. You know, people. Now, you might say that'll be the party that nobody comes to, and then don't do it. Um, because people are just not care about it. Just, I always feel like I'm not the right audience, so I have a lot of opinions. They might go wrong. Isn't this also just feasibility? It it is uh, feasibility. We're not into schematic design. No, I'm just saying. I mean, it's a feasibility report. No. Somebody's going to end up with the design. Listen. Do it again. Yeah. <laughs> and do like all the things you're talking about. That, that, so I feel that's like, fair enough. Out these options and place them on the wall, and then post it. I mean, at least there'd be, I don't know if that's too open. It's too open. <laughs> the gallery wall. I also. agree with unfacilitated. I think yeah. it's not going to get smart. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, but still, the only direction to go I still believe the process that we're using is the right process. And that if you open it up to the world now, I'm not sure it's very. I focus much more on trying to get as many people in answering questions right. on that now and let the professionals, including us, uh, you know, come to some reasonable conclusion. 
And then the next step in the process is kind of that. Yeah, that's fair. I think that's right. And I also, I think we're we're not going to reach people that currently don't use the library. And some of these space changes might bring people back to the library, right? Yeah. And so I, I think, you know, I really rely on our professional expertise in the building too. Um, and my staff's, uh, you know, their, what they see, but also what our neighboring libraries and things see too, and what's been successful and not. So we're trying to rely on that knowledge as well. Just Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. And the one thing I'll say is, in terms of your feedback, we're not asking you to choose one, two, or three. Any feedback, it can be mix and match, you know, all thoughts are helpful thoughts, and we'll take it all in and be able to make it. Yeah. Thank you all for your Thank time. You. Sorry to cut thoughts. No, no, no. <laughs> Thank you. You're making some you of those questions. That's sure, right. I didn't take questions. questions. I, I was quite wrong. You're making some <laughs> of those feel old. And built this. <laughs> I can't believe it's 17 years since. Well, uh, your amazing. your granddaughter was how old when this was constructed? I, too young. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so she's so. 25 now. So yeah, yeah. she was probably five or six. Let me see if got another uh, just one more agenda for the committee. Thank you. Thank you, so Thank you everybody. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So we have. Uh, in the new business, uh, we want to uh, talk for a moment about uh, the uh, in-person hybrid versus uh, remote versus whatever. We, we have a number of options that we can, we can explore, but uh, the bottom line is that, uh, you know, Stuart, you've done a, a survey of the, uh, of the committee, and uh, it seemed like uh, I thought your suggestion was a good one to have a wide report. I'm not sure. One of you said that uh, maybe four meetings or so a year uh, would be kind of this model in person, uh, you know, a presentation or kind of a major milestone event that would be it's, it's fruitful to meet in person. Um, but uh, I want to just get a sense from the committee as to what, uh, what the thoughts are about uh, uh, hybrid uh, cross eyed in person versus building the open center. I would agree with what you just said. I think there are certain times when it's viable, but the person flexibility is viable as well. Maybe most of the meetings are not necessarily. Historically, we've had trouble getting a quorum during summer months when people are on vacation, and, and yet we can probably get a quorum. Yeah, I agree. I think the biggest thing to me is is that like at tonight's meeting, I think we underestimated the amount of time that was needed. Um, and I think also that being in person on some of these working issues, I think you can accomplish a lot more in face to face than you can just remote. In terms of the next meeting, um, I'm anticipating that we'll distribute the final report for the uh, sound and light study. Um, and also uh, the final report for the CAD. We're going through um, editing on both of those documents. You've already received and seen the majority of those. Um, so I don't know that we need to spend a lot of time on those, but if we do want to spend time again on this topic, would it be more helpful to, to be in person again or not? 
Stuart, your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, from my standpoint is that I think we've done enough in the library and I think that the next meeting, it, it should be high, it can be choice hybrid. Um, I, I think it'll be very valuable to get some input before then. But for any study, I mean, this is just a general comment. So I'm not sure if I will answer. I don't think we need a face to face next time. But I, I think everybody if they want to do it, we could do a hybrid. But I think it's those studies where we really need to work through the issues and, and look through that stuff. And I would ask Hank, you know, just looking at the chart now, we, I don't suggest we do it now. We don't have the time, but we go through here and figure out where those points in time are. And those become the cornerstones for certain meetings. And then as we move forward, we decide if we do need an in-person meeting and request an in-person meeting. That's just my general comments. I will talk less if we're online and ask less questions. So <laughs> I see that's a debate, but I don't that's sure if other people will you know, engage. You know, how do we engage differently, right? It's just so easy for me to do this rather than raise my hand and do this. And frankly, you know, right. Right. Because I think I think we're very, very pointed right is that those things we got to work through it's it's we should be in person but to that point are you saying that we should actually do more in person on more of the topics or just on certain types no i wasn't saying i'm just saying if, if the things that we think are critical like in the library we've had this meeting in person i don't think the next one has to be in person I agree. right 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 i think when we when we tackle uh, uh yeah, yeah hairy stuff we should be here and then the follow-ups can be as they have always been. Um, I also think the relationship is built. I think yeah. Well, with the Great point. That's yeah. good Once point. you meet with somebody and you look them in the eye and you create a relationship, next time you'll feel just as comfortable saying something to friends because right. you've already looked at him in that conversation. Yes. So I think when you have the first initial big conversation, having it in person is important. And then you have a solid foundation for the next meeting. I don't think you have to be in the next time. The final reports we've, we've seen a lot of that information already. Yeah. I'm not sure we need that. We need a copy of the final report, but and, and have access to it so we can look at it, et cetera, and make the comments. But I don't think we need to be getting together just to do it. Not for the whole review. So, and I will try to distribute. Um, those two final reports at least a week in advance of the next uh, meeting. Uh, so I'll have to see how far we get on the BPW project with um, Weston and Sampson and whether we, we're, we're really in the programming stages. I don't think we're in the options stages quite yet. Um, but when we do get into the review of the options, I think that would be an appropriate one to be in person. And that's that's likely to be the 15th of May, um, is my guess right now. Uh, and we're also, uh, I, sh I should mention to the committee that after going through the theater sound and light study, um, we did identify those immediate needs, and the school department has is finding money hopefully in the end of, end of year budget. So we will be addressing some of those immediate needs at Pollard over April vacation, and putting out a bid package at the end of this month um, for addressing some of those immediate needs in Newman and Newman High School. Um, and the scope of those will be somewhat dependent upon how much money the school department has at their end of year budget. But it could be as much as a quarter of a million dollars. All right, so we could discuss some of those at our next meeting when we have the PPW options. Yes. Is that too late? Well, no, on, on those, I think I will be able to. Well, you already have the, the preliminary report or the draft report. And so all of the items that are immediate items, we hope to address within the next four months. Um, the ad alternates, if there's sufficient funding, would be to replace um, theater curtains. They're not flame fully inherently flame retardant with inherently flame retardant. 
curtains because then you don't have to go back and look at changing that. And that I think would be money well spent. Anything else? Uh, um, so it sounds like the next meeting will be Zoom. Yeah. And we'll potentially have a meeting on the 15th mm -hmm. in person if the DPW topic is at that stage. Yeah. So that means this uh, starts on uh, May, Monday, May 1st. So we should be done by this Monday. <laughs> That's hope. Yeah, exactly. Good. Thank you, Richard Chair. Yeah. My pleasure. I'm going to the next meeting with only two for the way. Yes, next meeting is Tuesday, the 25th. Oh, oh. Any final comments from our uh, guests online? None? Okay, well, uh, if not, we will uh, uh, take a motion then to adjourn. We have a motion to adjourn. Well, we'll, we'll okay, is there a second? Yeah. I guess we got to do the roll call one more time. <laughs> uh, Stuart? Aye. Then, Aye. George? Aye. Roy? Aye. Irwin? Aye. And uh, yeah, I'm sure we'll say. Thank you. Have a good week, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Roy, you didn't follow your advice. <laughs> that was a very good presentation. It was. Yeah.